Imagine this, you're 33,000 feet in the air, the sun blinding through the cockpit window. And no, your smartwatch won't save you, but a pair of sunglasses might. Not just any pair, the original Ray-Ban aviators built so pilots wouldn't scorch their eyes mid-flight. Not exactly made for fashion, at first. Here's the twist. What began as military gear? Boom, fast forward. And it's on the faces of Hollywood rebels, rock legends, and fashion icons. So what really makes Ray-Ban iconic? Is it the engineering or the image? Today, we're diving into how Ray-Ban went from fighter jets to fashion capitals, and why, nearly a century later, it's still untouchably cool. Spoiler, it's not just about blocking sunlight, it's about making a statement. Ray-Ban didn't start on a runway, it started in a military lab. In 1937, the U.S. Army Air Corps called on Bausch & Lum with one request, help our pilots stop going blind. The result? A teardrop-shaped lens designed to cut glare without compromising clarity. What began as protective gear for fighter pilots quietly became a legend, the aviator. But not all icons shout. Enter the Clubmaster, a quieter force, worn by thinkers, rebels, and pioneers. Take Taylor Mead, actor, poet, unapologetically himself in an era that didn't want him to be. He wore the Clubmaster not to fit in, but to stand out. Before, never hide was a slogan. It was a way of living. From cockpit tools to cultural touchstones, Ray-Ban kept evolving. Not just new shapes, but smarter specs. Chromance lenses to sharpen your world. Ray-Ban stories, co-created with Meta. Frames that shoot photos, take calls, play music. At its core, Ray-Ban still stands for authenticity, individuality, and effortless style. The message is clear, never hide. Because wearing Ray-Ban has never been just about seeing the world. It's about being seen. You think you're just buying sunglasses, a cool frame, maybe a brand you like? But what if I told you nearly every luxury eyewear brand you know, Prada, Versace, Ray-Ban, is quietly controlled by one company? Yep, that's Luxottica. And their grip on the eyewear world runs deep. Before a single frame hits shelves, there's a full-on research sprint. Not just Instagram scrolling, we're talking deep dives into fashion runways, 90s minimalism, disco color blocking, even obscure art collabs. It's part trend forecasting, part data lab. Sketches are still done by hand, but quickly move into CAD software, where every curve is fine-tuned in 3D. Some frames go through dozens of revisions before approval. Here's the twist. Ray-Bans may look vintage, but they're born from cutting-edge ergonomic testing and strategy. That timeless feel? It's the result of careful manipulation, trend data, tech precision, and just enough storytelling to make it all feel personal. What if I told you the material behind your sleek designer sunglasses comes from cotton? Not fabric, not thread. Just straight-up cotton balls and wood pulp. Kind of wild, right? That's the not-so-glamorous origin of acetate, the star material in most Ray-Ban frames. While metal alloys handle the heavy-duty parts, hinges, temple cores, anything structural, it's acetate that brings the curves, colors, and comfort. Let's zoom into the process. Raw cellulose from cotton or pulp is purified and mixed with acetic acid in a controlled reaction. The result? A soft, dense material with the texture of putty. You probably think your Ray-Bans were painted, right? Sprayed or dipped? Not even close. The color? It's baked in fuse deep into the material before it even looks like sunglasses. It all starts when the acetate is soft and putty-like, basically designer goo, blended with organic pigments and acetone. The result is a rich, saturated color that becomes part of the frame. No flaking, no fading, no shortcuts. Then come the hybrid blocks. Glossy sheets are rolled like colorful dough and shaped into thick slabs. This is where Ray-Ban gets creative, adding chips, layering colors, even crafting speckled patterns that look more fashion week than factory line. Personally, I love that no two frames are exactly alike. It's like a fingerprint for your face. Once formed, the blocks are cured under heat and pressure, locking everything in for the next phase of cutting, shaping, and chaos. Here's something wild. The frames of your Ray-Bans might have started out as giant colorful bricks. Not frames, not sheets, actual blocks. And now comes the part where those solid slabs get sliced down into the flexible base 
that'll one day hug your face. Each cured block is laid onto a bed and hydraulically pushed into a blade, like slicing gourmet cheese, but tougher and way less forgiving. The preset blade thickness ensures uniform sheets. One bad setting? Wasted material, or worse, warped frames that'll never sit right. But the twist? Even after slicing, the acetate is still soft. Think, cutting a lasagna that hasn't fully set. Yeah, patience and precision required. Workers lift the sheets by hand, hang them on racks, and prep them for the least glamorous but most crucial part, thermal stabilization. To start, CNC machines, the kind used in aerospace and luxury automotive industries, go to work. These machines don't just cut the front face of each frame, they sculpt it. Each line, each curve, each slot for the lenses, all done with robotic precision. But what's a perfectly cut frame without the right feel? Flat doesn't cut it when you're designing for a human face. That's where heat enters the picture. Each cutout front gets gently warmed, just enough to become pliable, like warm wax, and then molded to create that subtle, ergonomic curve that makes Ray-Bans sit comfortably and evenly on your face. This combo of surgical-grade cutting and hand-molded curving isn't just manufacturing, it's precision meets feel. It's why Ray-Bans slide on like they were made for you, not just made. Think the temples on your Ray-Bans are just plastic? Think again. They've got a metal core, an engineered curve, and a finish so smooth it would shame your bathroom countertop. These aren't just rods, they're reinforced, shaped, and refined like performance gear. Each temple starts as a thinner slice of acetate for comfort. After cutting, it's gently heated and bent to follow the curve behind the ear. Not too tight, not too loose. Inside, a metal truss is inserted for strength and flexibility, the hidden backbone that keeps everything in shape. On transparent frames, you can even see it. Sleek, subtle, oddly satisfying. Finally, the tips are sanded and polished by wheel. Not just for shine, but for feel. Ever worn cheap sunglasses that dig into your ears? That's what skipping this step gets you. Before your Ray-Bans ever shine on your face, they're tumbled like laundry inside wooden barrels full of polishing grit. It's chaotic, it's low-tech, and it works like magic. This first step in polishing is called barrel tumbling, where frames are gently spun in rotating wooden drums filled with polishing media. Basically, it's industrial exfoliation, smoothing out tiny imperfections left behind by shaping and cutting. It's a bit like buffing your nails, only with way more friction and zero pampering music. But that showroom-level shine? That takes a human touch. After tumbling, frames move to hand-polishing stations where skilled technicians use buffing wheels and soft cloths to bring out Ray-Ban's signature gloss. Here's where transparent acetate frames really shine. That internal metal truss, usually hidden in opaque models, becomes visible. And suddenly, structure becomes style. What do a centuries-old watchmaker and a Ray-Ban assembler have in common? Surprisingly, the tools. In a world of robotics and sensors, Ray-Ban's hinge assembly is still done by hand, using techniques that haven't changed in generations. Each frame gets fitted with nickel-silver hinges and steel screws, using the old-school rivet drilling method. Not glued, not clipped. Two precise holes are drilled into the acetate, and tiny rivets are hammered in with the finesse of a violin maker. The result? Hinges that aren't just sturdy, they're replaceable. If your Ray-Bans take a hit, you can swap the hinge, not toss the whole frame. And before they're approved, every hinge is tested for flexibility and tension, bent, pulled, twisted, to ensure that smooth one-handed fold doesn't give out over time. In a trend-chasing market, that kind of durability is the real flex. Would you trust your vision to a material used in plastic soda bottles or actual sand? That glowing orange orb you're seeing? It's silica, heated beyond 1,200 degrees Celsius, thick like honey, hot enough to incinerate almost anything, and just seconds away from becoming glass. This isn't just any glass. It's the base of mineral lenses, prized for their optical sharpness. It starts with ultra-pure silica sand, mixed with sodium carbonate to lower the melting point and calcium oxide for stability. Sometimes trace minerals tweak clarity, tint, or UV protection. Once melted, it becomes a glowing molten mass, more lava than liquid. It's poured into molds to form lens blanks. Then comes slow cooling, called annealing, 
to relieve internal stress and prevent microscopic fractures. You'll never see that part, but you'll feel the difference. Once cooled, the glass is cut, beveled, and coated with invisible tech. Anti-scratch, anti-reflective, UV protection, SPF, glare defense, and scratch armor, all in one finish. The result? Lenses that feel effortless, but started in chaos. Once the lenses are polished, coated, and beveled to perfection, they're not just snapped into frames like Lego. Skilled technicians, often with years of experience, manually insert each lens with precision. Millimeters matter. Too tight, the frame cracks. Too loose, the lens pops out mid-conversation. Definitely not the look. It's not just alignment. It's about tension, balance, and long-term clarity. A lens must sit flush to avoid pressure points or distorted vision. Especially with prescriptions, even a slight tilt can throw off depth perception. After fitting, each pair goes through final inspection, checking alignment, light reflection, and how the frame holds up to handling. And honestly, after all the tech, CNC carving, UV curing, coatings, the last step still comes down to human hands. It's almost poetic, in an industrial kind of way. So here's a thought. With all this tech, would you trust a robot to do your final lens fitting? Or do you think the human touch still has the edge? Let me know. I'm seriously torn on this one. What if the final step in your Ray-Ban's journey, the one that makes them feel premium or forgettable, isn't design or tech, but packaging? After the lenses are set and polished, each pair is cleaned to deliver that crisp, brand new feel. Even the hinge resistance and soft click are part of the experience. The Ray-Ban logo, laser etched or tampo printed, isn't just for looks, it's instant recognition. And let's be real, if you're not tilting your head to show it off, are you even wearing Ray-Bans? Then comes the unboxing, case, cloth, tags, and that all-important authenticity card. And it's not random. Each pair is routed through Luxottica's own distribution network. Flagship stores, Sunglass Hut, Lens Crafters. Because Luxottica doesn't just make Ray-Bans, they control how you find them. If you've ever looked at a pair of Ray-Bans and thought, why do these feel so different? Well, now you've seen why. From cotton-derived acetate to laser-etched logos and precision-milled hinges, it's not just eyewear. It's an experience built layer by layer. So here's a question for you. Which part surprised you the most? The handcrafted frame, the lens tech, or the near-monopoly distribution? Drop your thoughts below. I actually read them. And if you thought this was fascinating, wait till you see how luxury frames can end up costing more than a smartphone. And who's really setting those price tags? Like, subscribe, stick around, and I'll see you in the next teardown.